Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Green Chemistry Education Webinar Series hosted by Beyond Benign and Green Chemistry Commitment. Um, my name is Amy Cannon. I'm the Executive Director here at Beyond Benign, a nonprofit dedicated to green chemistry education in K-12 through through higher ed. This webinar series is designed to highlight relevant topics in green chemistry education for faculty and students who are looking to adopt green chemistry in their courses and programs. So we're broadcasting live, as always, and recording this session. So all attendees are in listen-only mode and all lines are muted. If you have any questions at any point, um, just type it right into the question chat box right there on your control panel. Um, and also feel free to let us know if you are a group of students or a class that's tuning in, um, we'll, we'll give you a, a shout out. So feel free to uh, type that right into your question and chat box there. The recording will be posted on the link that you see right here in the welcome box and also on the slides. Um, so feel free to access it at any point after for any supporting documents as well. For those of you who participate in social media, um, please connect with us on Twitter or Facebook. And if you, if you um, would like to do any live tweeting, tweeting during our webinar, um, we'd love to hear it. So thank you so much for joining this webinar for taking part in the discussion. This webinar is being brought to you as part of the Green Chemistry Commitment Program, which is a consortium program aimed at transforming chemistry education, growing the number of practitioners of green chemistry, um, growing departmental resources, and effect, affecting systemic change in chemistry education. The program is voluntary and flexible and designed um, around student learning objectives and designed to promote the work that you're currently doing at your institution that can serve as models for others to get involved. If you'd like any more information on that, feel free to email me, amy underscore cannon at beyondbenign.org or Derek, our, our higher ed program manager that you see right on the screen here. As part of the webinar series, we always give away a green chemistry book at the conclusion of the webinar, so we'll randomly um, announce that winner, the randomly selected winner at the end of the uh, webinar today, and we'll, you'll receive an email at, um, from us requesting your contact information, and we'll get that right out to you. All right, so with that, I'm very happy to um, introduce John Warner for today's webinar. We're really happy to have him discussing um, green chemistry and the circular economy. Um, a very relevant topic today, so I'm going to introduce John briefly, and then I'm going to hand the controls over to him for the remainder of the webinar. And um, we'll, again, feel free to put in those, those questions at any point. We'll get to questions right after John's presentation. John doesn't need too much of an introduction here, but he is one of the founders of the field of green chemistry, co-authoring the defining text green chemistry theory and practice with Paul Anastas in 1998. He has over 30 years of experience in industry, academia, and entrepreneurship, most recently at the Warner Babcock Institute of Green Chemistry, where he co-founded the institute, and he serves as the chief technology officer. Throughout his years, he's been a very pro prolific inventor in green chemistry, um, with 185 published patents and patent applications across 72 families of inventions. So John has received numerous awards. I'll, I'll mention a couple. Um, he received the 2000, 2004 Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring, one of the highest awards for, in US um, education, science education. And in 2014, the Perkin Medal, which is recognized as one of the highest honors in the American, indus in American industrial chemistry. Um, he continues to, uh, well, like I said, he serves as the co-founder and, and chief technology officer at Warner Babcock, and he also continues teaching. Uh, I will note that he's teaching green chemistry at the Harvard Extension School in the spring of 2019, if, um, and if I'm not mistaken, there might still be uh, a chance to register if you, if you want to hear more of John. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over the controls to John to talk to us about uh, green chemistry and the circular economy. Great. Well, thank you, Amy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, a, and an honor to be to be part of um, this program. I, if everything goes well, I just clicked show my screen. So perhaps we're seeing my slides. Is it all good? Looks great. 
Excellent. Good. Well, thank you all for taking the time to, to listen to me. Hopefully I can I can uh, answer some questions. My email address here, john.warner at wannababcock.com. If there's any questions you don't get to during this um, this this web webinar, I'm happy to answer any questions. I may, may be slow to respond, but I do respond to everything. Uh, I like to start these um, discussions by giving a disclaimer that I don't claim any gifted insight. I don't have some key insights that anyone else doesn't have. It's just that I've lived my life where I, my first uh, 10 years of professional life, I was an industrial chemist working at Polaroid doing chemistry. My second decade of, of professional life, I was a educator or a professor of chemistry and plastics engineering, learning about teaching chemistry. The third decade of my professional life, I've been an inventor working at the Wanna Babcock Institute, learning about inventing chemistry. And throughout the three decades, I've been involved off and on in various aspects of chemicals policy, working with the state of California, the state of Massachusetts, uh, the United States EPA, the uh, REACH legislation, being kind of the token chemist uh, opining on various chemicals policy initiatives. Um, and so, so I don't claim to be a master of anything, but have had been blessed to see the chemical enterprises from all the aspects of doing, teaching, inventing, and managing. And I share with you my thoughts with no claim that I've got it right. I think we need a society where we're free to share our views with one another and can build off of them. So those things that, that work for you, I happy and those things that don't work for you I apologize and happy to have a conversation but I could be wrong or right it's just the way that I'm looking at things uh, green chemistry you know the the has been around for well over 20 years the the book itself has um, been out this is the 20th anniversary of the book I only have these four uh, um, international things. I'm told that there's 12 or 13 translations, but as an author, I haven't necessarily been given copies, so I know that I've got these four here. Um, and of course, everyone on the phone probably is familiar with the 12 principles of green chemistry. Uh, it's nice to see things coming around after 20 years. I'm just excited by organizations like Beyond Benign and globally. It just seems right now there's an explosion of interest in green chemistry. I can't tell you how many countries across the globe just now in 2018 are starting to put together green chemistry initiatives. So it seems that this 20 year latency is just all of a sudden happening and it's exciting times. And it's great to, to, to be part of this. And I see green chemistry, you know, when we think about all the aspects of sustainability, whether it's cradle to cradle or circular economy or all the different programs that brilliant people have put together, I see green chemistry being in service to all of these sustainability initiatives to be the beakers and flasks mechanistic uh, component to inventing a future of sustainability. As anyone who's ever heard me has said, has will we'll test. What I always say is that green chemistry has three components. Yes, a technology must be more environmentally benign than some alternative technology, but that's not enough. If it's just a, a journal article, if it's just a conference discussion, and it's not out in the real world, it's not accomplishing the goals that we seek. So in addition to being more environmentally benign than some alternative technology, it's got to work better or at least as good. And it has to cost the right price because obviously there's all kinds of sociological problems if the better, safer technologies are more expensive. So the only way in my opinion that you have green chemistry is if you have something that works better than the incumbent technology, costs better than the incumbent technology, and oh, by the way, is safer for human health and the environment. Then you have green chemistry. Throughout history, especially in the last 30 years, there have been initiatives, there have been products, there have been good stories and bad stories about success and failure in the marketplace. But I would argue that the, the, the times that things didn't succeed was probably because it missed the mark on performance or cost. And when I say cost, I mean cost throughout the entire value chain of, of 
constructing you know new factories or whatever if the economics don't work and the performance aren't good you're gonna have a hard time however if the performance is good and the cost is appropriate i would argue there are no additional barriers to green chemistry than any other technology. We must remember that people were manufacturing uh, vacuum tubes years after the transistor was invented. The incumbent technology has never lied down and said, take me, I'm yours to a revolutionary new technology. What we have seen over the last 30 years is green chemistry, unfortunately, doesn't actually help you get into the market. I wish we were in a world where it did, but the reality is it really doesn't. And so for us to be successful, we've got to play by the same rules as the market has. Hopefully with all the work that's being done with people and chemicals policy and with the NGOs around the world, our life is getting easier. But at this point in time, we really aren't making a significant edge on that. So from my perspective, there is no additional barrier for green chemistry, except for one. And that one is I would argue, we don't have an inventive force yet fully trained in green chemistry, so we can't meet these challenges, all right? And so that's the way that I'm looking at. So it requires us to look at chemistry from a different perspective. Now, just to make sure that people understand where I'm coming from, sustainability, in, in my opinion, is an overarching concept that covers all aspects of human endeavor whether it's economics, agriculture, education, anything. Green, sustainable chemistry is the part that talks about molecules and materials. But even that is a huge um, slice of the pie here. We have chemicals policy, remediation, exposure control, green chemistry, water purification, alternative energy, others. Green chemistry I see as a subset of sustainable chemistry. When people say sustainable chemistry, otherwise known as green chemistry, I kind of get sad because they probably haven't read the book. Uh, sustainable chemistry is a much larger and, and much older um, thing that's been around for a long time. But the point is that green chemistry is essentially agnostic to the use of the material, the intended use. So you can have a water purification membrane that is doing important sustainable chemistry. You are purifying water to give pure water to the appropriate people. But if you're using epichlorohydrin or some carcinogen in the synthesis of your membrane, you're still not doing green chemistry. Doesn't mean that you should stop what you're doing. The world needs pure water. If you have a solar panel and the components of the solar panel are using toxic materials, well, you still got a sustainable technology, but it's not a green chemistry technology. In 20 years, when we start to look what to do with these old solar panels, you know, we're going to be scratching our heads, wishing we did things differently. And so green chemistry is a subset that doesn't focus on what the technology does, but focuses on what the technology is. So it looks at the solvents, the catalysts, the feedstocks, the toxicity, the persistence. The, well, you know, there's 12 principles, so why don't break it up 12 ways? That's kind of the way that I look at it. So just to put this in context, and if anyone's ever heard me before, you've heard me get on the soapbox, that there's a big difference between green chemistry and sustainable chemistry, because green chemistry removes discussion of intended use and focuses on the intrinsic properties of the materials themselves. So lies in the domain of invention and design of the product level. So how does this tie into the, to the uh, circular economy? The way I look at it is, let's imagine a group of humans wanted to build a pond. What would we do? We'd dig a hole, we would fill it up with water, we would put in some plants, we'd put in some fish, and about three weeks later we would come back and everything would be dead, all right? And the reason for that is that we just don't know enough about how to do things like this. We're getting better, and there certainly are human-engineered bonds and things like that, so this is more of an illustration joke. But the point of the matter is, is that if we were to build a real pond, it would never be as successful as a real pond uh, in which essentially that real pond has been around for a very long time 
thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And so that the plants and the animals and the bees and the bugs and the birds and the beetles, everything co-evolved together to create a dynamic equilibrium, not only of materials, not only are molecules going from different species to support an ecosystem, but the energetics, and that's the key, the energetics of breaking and making molecules are also co-intertwined to make it work. And so we humans aren't quite up, I would argue, to this task just yet. But we can, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be working on it. You know, because now we're getting so better at understanding the chemistry and the inter interrelated systems of, of molecules in nature. How, you know, this is just a small snapshot of some of the systems that are understood in, in, the, in your most basic of cells. Okay, you know, you can't even read the molecules, it's so complicated. But we humans are starting to figure these things out. We're starting to understand how molecules have different dynamic equilibria it, you know, that are interchanged between different parts of cells, between different cells, between different species, between different ecosystems. So there is a fractal organization of matter and energy that holds this all together. And we humans are a tiny part of that ecosystem, but with industry and our ability to change the world around us, we have the greatest impact, yet we don't have enough knowledge to do it right. Right now, what are we talking about when we talk about the when we talk about tying things together? There's a factory, let's say this one's over in in Europe somewhere, and this factory is in South America, and this factory is in the United States, and this factory is you know somewhere in Asia, right? And then we have the textiles industry, and we have the electronics industry, and we have the pharmaceutical industry, and we have the cosmetics industry. Here we are in 2018, and we're saying somehow these should all join together. Somehow we gotta find a way to have all the inputs and the outputs go together. But the problem is like the pond that had thousands of years to organize, these things did not become in existence aware of each other. The factories and the products all evolved completely un you know, in a box, not knowing anything about its neighboring technologies. So here we are, it's 2018, and we're trying to connect something that this, these factories have been around for decades. These products have been around for decades. And now we're saying, after all of these years, how can we put them together? And that task is daunting, and it's not going to be easy. But it's not impossible because there's one thing that ties everything on this slide together, and that is chemistry. And we chemists and people working in the chemical enterprises and people who are designing future products and people involved in education need to realize, although this task is hard and we have a lot to work out, nothing could be more important that to invent a sustainable future, we need to rethink how all of these products, all these materials, all of these systems can intertwine so that we can imagine a day in the future of complex dynamic equilibrium tying these together in the same way that a pond might. But as I said, this isn't something we can sit, do, and design now. We need invention, we need discovery, and we need to really science this up an awful lot before we can get there. So the way I look at it is the circular economy is a key concept that we need to all embrace that essentially looks at natural resources, we manufacture products, we distribute them, we use them, then we collect them, and we try to keep them in a cycle. And this is a noble goal that we must always work towards. But here's a problem. In a closed loop like this, where does invention happen? How do we get an invention to add to this picture? That's not easy. And so me being a twisted guy as I am, I have a different model here. And I just add a little twist to it. And I look at it as a Mobius strip. If anyone's not familiar with the Mobius strip, it's when you tie a loop, cut it, twist it a half away, and then reconnect it so that you essentially have to go around the loop twice before you get to the origin. 
way I look at it is we have the material cycle, the materials ecology is one cycle, but we have also what I call intellectual ecology in which we look at the inventive process and how it has impact across this year. And so we have basic research, applied research, development, scale up, commercialization, going back to basic research that we have to constantly be in touch. The inventors, the developers, and the designers must be constantly in touch with how the real world operates, how companies you know, manage their supply chains, how we build things, how we distribute things, and inventors need to come out of their little labs and poke their heads out and find out how the real world operates to be able to do this. And instead of it being a spoke and wheel where we have arbitrary points of contact, I use the, the, the Mobius strip to, to essentially say it has to be at all aspects. And so we need to really get better at understanding how all these things are connected together. And so, yeah, I don't want to scare people. The word thermodynamics was in the title. I'm not going to go deep into the science. I'm going to have a, a few words that are crazy, but um, trust me, it's, it's not going to be too deep of a, of a, of a science discussion here. Um, but essentially, the way I look at it is Josiah Willard Gibbs, um, back quite a bit ago, uh, came up with this concept that is called Gibbs Free Energy. Okay, Albert Einstein called Gibbs the greatest mind in American history. That's not a pretty, that's pretty, pretty cool thing for someone to be called, right? So Delta G, Gibbs free energy, has two components. One component we call enthalpy, and another component we call entropy. Now, I'm not going to go into a long lecture of the difference between these two, okay? But, um, and we can have a, an offline conversation about that. But essentially, enthalpy is the strength of individual interactions in a way. It's what compounds um, the, the strength between an interaction, like a bond breaking or something like that. Whereas entropy, we can think of as a, a more of a statistical analysis of groups of things. That's a super oversimplification. But I, I, like I said, we don't have time to go into deeper things. Hopefully, after this conversation, you'll, you'll through illustrative uh, examples, it'll make some sense. But one way to look at it is one of, one of my uh, heroes is Janine Benyus. Janine Benyus has written a book, Biomimicry, and it's, it's been around about the same, same length of time as green chemistry. And Janine is brilliant in the way that she presents the concept of biomimicry and how to look at a product, at a product level and design in uh, how nature would do something. Now, being contemporary with Janine, but uh, a, a little bit from another perspective, I, as a chemist, when I started working in industry, started to have this similar thoughts about how we do things in industry from a chemical perspective. My formal training at Princeton was in medicinal chemistry. The first things I did as a graduate student was design molecules as drugs, anti-cancer drugs. And so looking at enzyme systems and cellular systems and how to get things through cell membranes and all that, that's kind of the way I looked at the world. When I went to Polaroid and I started working at Polaroid, I saw that manufacturing was so unnatural to the way humans did things, okay? And that it's it, so the and so you, nature just does things so differently. And what I I developed this concept. I said, you know, humans have an enthalpy bias. We do everything looking at it through a delta H enthalpy bias, and nature has an entropy bias, and that, it, it, you know. That, I feel, is the heart of everything. Now, again, an oversimplification would be that humans spend a great deal of time forcing molecules to do what we want them to do. As Janine would say, we heat, beat, and treat things to make things do what we want. I would argue that is an enthalpic perspective to design. Nature, on the other hand, everything happens at ambient temperature, ambient pressure, using mostly water, if any solvent at all, and it accomplishes those tasks because it uses 
entropy as a design force. Okay, and so this is for us to get to this world where we have a circular economy where all the materials are intertwined, we really need to look at the difference between entropy and enthalpy. And so I've come up with these crazy things, these five things that I'm going to quickly go through that what I consider molecular mechanisms of sustainable circular materials. Now, these words are terrible and I apologize, but they're the best words I could come up with. I'm going to give simple illustrations of them so that you can better understand the way that I'm looking at this thing. So the first of the five is what I call equilibrium discontinuities. And what I, Renee Thom back in the 60s published a bunch of books on catastrophe theory. Another amazing scientist that looked at dynamic equilibrium and how dynamic equilibrium would slowly evolve that we couldn't perceive any change. It looks like a static system. Then all of a sudden, bang, something happens. And we don't really know why it happens. And that's explained through the dynamics of, of catastrophe theory. One way to look at it is the following. Let's say I had a grain of salt and I'm, I'm taking a bunch of salt and I'm making a pile of salt on the table getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What we know through anecdotal experience is that last grain of salt doesn't do this, right? We know that that last grain of salt, catastrophe, everything falls down. It's interesting. Why is it that it was stable up to a certain point and then boom, everything comes down? We're now at the ability, using the mathematics of catastrophe theory, we can look at the shapes of the particles, the friction between the particles, and we can calculate, we can start to really understand why that pile of salt was stable and then all of a sudden fell apart. Mathematics and the science is getting there. We can look at that. And now we're surrounded by a world that has very similar types of transitions. You know, that essentially when you think about chemistry, when you t think about materials, it's almost always this way, right? We don't say that a, a material is 50% melted at one temperature and 70% melted at another temperature. No, it's a solid, it's a solid, bang, it's a liquid, it's a liquid. Nature is filled with these spontaneous changes that are nonlinear, that abide by this, these, the mathematics of catastrophe theory. So if you, if you accept that, that we can understand things at a materials level before and after a transition, why is this solid melting at a higher melting point than this solid? We can figure that out. Why does this thing dissolve in this solvent but not in this solvent? We can figure this out. We have the tools of science to do that. Now, if we take our thermodynamic lens and look at that and look at our products, all of a sudden what we're looking at here is shelf life stability, product performance, and product stability. And that very simple statement, looking at catastrophe theory, tipping point theory, whatever you want to call it, in the design of a product, when you want shelf life stability, you want to be on one side of the tipping point. When you want product stability, you want to be on the other side and you want to control when it happens. You want the paint not to dry in the can, but you want it to dry on the wall and you want it to happen at a certain speed. You know, all, all over, we can think of how this applies. So, Again, this isn't, you know, a commercial for WBI, the Wanna Babcock Institute, but to put some tangible ex examples here, one example is the asphalt technology we came up with. As you know, there's a, there's a billion miles of roads in the United States, all right, across the country, the sun and the air oxidize the surface of these roads, and they get brittle and hard. So about 10% every year, is dug up and repaved. Now that brittle stuff that we dig up is too hard to use in a new pavement, so most of it is going into a landfill. We may use five or 10% to put it back in the ground. And so I was saying, man, this is a tipping point issue. Can I put in a small molecule that will control that tipping point so that I can reuse all that, re um, that that um, oxidized pavement. And so 
essentially we, we dug up our driveway, took the idea. The workers came to the house. They were laughing. They, it was really cold. It was around Thanksgiving. You know, we used a ton of, uh, of, of recycled material. The workers were laughing at me saying it would never work. They were going to drop a big hockey puck on my front lawn and drive away. I was scared, but you know what? It worked. And within a year, we started a company called Collaborative Aggregates, and we're selling it. We call it Delta S. <laughs> Get it? Um, and so this is an example of using entropy um, to to essentially control the spontaneity of coassivation when when you're, you're using an, an asphalt material. Another example we use, I, I, I can use, is, is about hair shaping and toning. If you take you know, if you, in, sign, in DNA, thionine in DNA undergoes a two plus two photodimerization. It's a photoreaction that essentially links the, the DNA together. So we took biopolymers, we put thionine into biopolymers, and we, sh we showed that we can use this to either control the shape of hair or to put pleats or wrinkle resistancy into fabrics where essentially what we have is we build into these water-soluble, non-toxic polymers this tipping point that goes from soluble to insoluble to construct three-dimensional um, structure within fabrics and materials. The second mechanism is what I call collaborative structures. And the way I explain this one is most people who work for organizations, every once in a while we get sent to some, some workshop in which we have to do a skills assessment. This person goes and finds out I'm good at math. This person finds out I'm good at communication. And a unwise organization says people should work on their deficiencies. And so they send the people off to workshops so that the person at math gets better at communicating and the person communicating gets better at math. Now, the reason the person is good at math is because they love math. The reason the person is good at communicating is that they're good at communicating. So by taking workshops to do things that they don't enjoy, you just get a lot of sad people. Smart organizations, instead wise organizations, for, understand people's skills and have them collaborate so that the person that's good at math is collaborating with the person who's good at communicating. Everyone's doing more and more of what they love, and at the end, you've got a lot of happy people. What I realized is although this makes common sense to human behavior, it actually should apply to chemistry too. That what we do in chemistry is we make these island of Dr. Moreau molecules. This poor molecule here, it has that group to do one function. This group is performing another function. This group is doing another function. This group is doing another function. This is doing another function. And all we really want is this simple molecule here. But what do we do? We put all this spinach on it to do these things when all we really needed was that simple molecule. And so when we modify a molecule as chemists, and we're not thinking through a thermodynamic lens, we're not thinking about the circular economy, we're just thinking as traditional chemists, we put a, if we want to make this molecule on the left called hydroquinone less water soluble, we will do the methyl ethyl propyl butyl feudal game of trying to modify this molecule to make it do what we want. But what we're really doing is we're changing the intermolecular forces between the molecules in the surroundings. That's what we're really doing. So even though we're using the tools of covalent chemistry to derivatize the molecule, that's not the way nature works at all. Nature, if you look at a cell membrane, a cell membrane is a collaboration of all kinds of different molecules, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, all different things collaborate so that you get that total integrated uh, properties because of all these individual components. So why not do that in chemistry? Instead of doing the methyl ethyl propyl butyl feudal game, add a second molecule and have that second molecule. So now we're doing design at the formulation level. And so that we formulate by first principles 
to essentially construct the system that would have required all kinds of chemical synthesis, but instead we design it that way. And the cool thing is U.S. patent law and global patent law recognizes a first principles designed formulation as a composition of matter. And so all of a sudden you can achieve these properties. And, and this is what, if you're familiar with the work that I do, I call this non-covalent de derivatization. Okay, and one of the, ex I got a couple examples in the real world. One is in the pharma industry. This molecule here, copper ATSM, is brick dust. It is completely insoluble. To get it into any animal, you're going to dissolve it in DMSO with a bunch of surfactants. You can never use it for a human thing. However, using the tools of non-covalent derivation and designing other molecules in, you can increase the bioavailability. And we're pretty psyched that we essentially you know, got some attention from the Michael J. Fox Foundation early on. And in Australia, we've just exited phase one clinical trials and are in phase two clinical trials with an ALS um, um, therapy that is based on this kind of, of chemistry. Another example, is in hair color restoration. You know, one day I'm thinking about a beetle and how when a beetle sheds its exoskeleton, um, it can't grow with it, so it gets rid of it, gets bigger, and over the course of a couple hours, turns hard and black. So I looked at that and I said, huh, there's a process in, chem in nature that goes from, from soft and white to hard and black. Well, People color their hair. This is a product that you can get at CVS today and at Target and Walmart today. And look what the, the key ingredient is. Lead tetraacetate. You can't sell a house in the United States with lead paint, but you can pour it on your head to color your hair. It's crazy. All right. And so I looked into this thing. It's called sclerotization when the bugs do this. And, and it's a terosinase oxidative cascade. And so I looked at the biochemistry, they didn't grind up dead bugs. I mimicked this chemistry, bought a bunch of gray hair, stuck it in, and it worked. But what was interesting, it, it, it didn't work. Um, all the hair didn't come the same color. Some was dark, some was light. I called the vendor who sold me the hair, and they said, oh, John, that's not one person's hair. That's like a bunch of, oh, so I realized I'm the grayest person in the building. I jump in a chair, hit me. My hair goes back to the color it was 30 years ago. Someone with black hair, we do her hair. It goes black. Someone with brown hair, it goes brown. This does not color someone's hair. What it does is it recreates the actual human pigment. And it's doing it by making an NCD of the pigment aggregates. And um, I don't want to get into to high technology here, but, but what's happening is it controls the way the little aggregates, the little packing of these molecules happen within the hair. In the same way that you have a fingerprint, you have a hairprint. And so Paul Hawken, hearing of this, started the company Hairprint. And Hairprint has now been on the market for over three years selling, selling this product called Hairprint, um, myhairprint.com. If you act now, hurry up. Um, before the Christmas season, $39.99, I think, in the box. Kidding. Uh, but, but this is a successful technology based on the recognition of molecular collaboration. Third one is pre-associative reactivity. And I already said this earlier, for over 180 years of modern chemistry, we do amazing things, but we heat things under high temperature, apply high pressures, use harsh reagents, and nature outperforms us not only in what it makes, but how it makes it at room temperature, at ambient pressure, using water as a solvent. Why? What is the magic in nature that, that's happening here within cells? What is the magic that allows this to happen? Well, what I realized is what I call a thermometer is a molecular speedometer. That essentially, when we learn chemistry, in, in the first and second year of chemistry, what we learn is that electrons occupy certain geometries in space. All right, and usually, no one knows, we just learn it and memorize it and learn it and memorize it. And it's so sad because understanding where the electrons are around an atom or within a molecule gives you so much information. And the most important information that you learn 
is that when you put two molecules in a solution and you ask them to react together, well, what they mostly do is just bang into each other and do nothing. That molecular reactions, organic molecular reactions, require a precise trajectory in which one molecule must approach the other molecule at exactly the perfect angle. So 99.999% of the time, they just bang off of each other. So when we heat up chemistry, when we put things under high pressure, what we're really doing is just increasing the frequency of collisions, not the ones we want, all of them. And so statistically, the one that we want to have happen happens. But man, what a waste of energy, what a waste of time. And what my epiphany was is that there's almost never a reactive collision in nature. In nature, never almost do two molecules bang into each other and react. What happens in nature is that all the cells are in a semi-viscous state where molecules are diffusion limited. And what they do is what I say, they, they snuggle up to each other molecularly first. The same bond, the same electron orbitals that control reactivity control orientation so that the molecules first create some self-assembled system and then react. And so if we look at our manufacturing processes, if we look at our products and try to take this hint from nature and look at a way to have our materials first orient by themselves, not through some external force of energy, but through some intrinsic properties, the hydrogen bonding, the pi stacking, the lipophilic interactions of the molecules, we can actually control this so much better. One example of this, we have, uh, we've developed a, a wood composite adhesive. You know, you've heard the stories of formaldehyde and isocyanates in um, wood composites. Big problem. The formaldehyde we've heard about, the isocyanates, is becoming a worse and worse problem for a variety of different reasons. So looking at this concept of of controlling reactivity through prior associations, we've invented an entirely new set of, of wood composite technologies that are all green chemistry that essentially we did a, a multi-ton pilot scale run in Canada that, and we had it all specified for OSB lumber. Oriented strand board lumber is one of the largest building materials in North America. This works also for MDF, for particle board, for you know all, all wood composite technologies. It outperforms industry standard, the performance characteristics. It's parity on cost, but not a drop of formaldehyde, not a drop of MDI. And this is, this is done through the lens of, of this entropic control in the materials design. Another example we're super excited about is we're launching just this month a new co. We've come up with a new solar energy technology. It's something related to dye-sensitized solar cells, but it, it, you might as well call it that. And Michael Gretzel, the world leader of, of solar, cell, solar cell research and the founder of this technology uh, in Switzerland, um, we sent him these, these, these cells and he performed tests on them and it is the highest performing Disensitized solar cell in history. We're really excited. This is for indoor applications. Imagine having your, the back of your cell phone be constantly charging your cell phone so you never plug it in. Imagine the Internet of Things, all the indoor things that have batteries, having a little solar collector that's constantly charging them. This is done because the way that these cells, these things are manufactured is using this assisted design so that the semiconductor and the electrolyte are all prior oriented. <clears throat> Next one is synchronous orthogonal mechanisms. This is the biggest tongue twister of them all. But the one I find really important. Here's the point. All right, I'm a, I'm, anyone who knows me knows that I'm a crazy science fiction fan and Star Trek especially. I dream of the Star Trek replicator. Can you imagine having every city, maybe every house, having this box? And you go to this box, you take a lawn chair and a Billy Bass fish, and you throw it in the box. You push a button, and you take out a laptop computer. 
Now that's crazy. That's silly. That's, wait a minute. Is it really? What's going on here? Well, here's the problem. Our traditional way of looking at chemistry, we look at them as one person soliloquies. We look at chemistry as being molecule A comes on stage and gets turned into molecule B, which comes on stage and gets turned into molecule C, which gets on stage. Maybe there's a couple of them reacting together. But that's not how we have to do chemistry if we want a circular economy. If we want to go into the future, we've got to change things. And so my, my example is imagine you're sitting on, in an audience and you're watching Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. And then, just for the heck of it, you're going to watch Richard III at the same time. The act is on the stage at the same time. They're unaware of each other. They're giving the same performance. So the two plays are happening on the same stage at the same time. Let's put on Macbeth. Let's put in King Lear. Let's put in another one. So now you're sitting in the audience and you've got this cacophony of things going on and you're going crazy trying to look at what's going on there, what's going on there. And you give up because it's almost impossible to follow four or five plays on a, slot, on, on a stage at the same time. But what happens in our cells? In the cells in our body, in nature, thousands of chemical reactions are happening at the same time. They are synchronous. They're happening at the same time, but they're unaware of each other. They're orthogonal. We need to really think about chemistry in that way. All right, and so here's my daughter a long time ago, Natalie, okay, and she's playing with this toy here, okay? This toy here, it's kind of an interesting toy. If you think about it, you can make two of them, make three of them, make four of them. That gets pretty boring, pretty fast. Okay, let's mix it up. Put a couple of different colors. Well, that's dull. All right, let's mix up the colors. Well, that's still not all that exciting. Let's put another, this two thing on there. This two thing or this three thing now enables you to do all kinds of crazy designs. Just introducing a new design element is a game changer, right? And so... When we do chemistry, when we do product design, there's something interesting here. Because in this case here, it's reversible. It's designed for disassembly. When my daughter goes to bed at night, my wife and I, we go and we take everything apart, we put it in the bag, and we start all over again tomorrow. They come apart, they go back together. That is a perfect circular mechanism. But there's parts that are not reversible at the same time. Those parts don't come apart. But here's the problem. If we wanted to make something complex, we don't have our hands to put these things together. Imagine taking these toys and saying, I want a red one, a green one, a blue one. I want to do the two over here or the three over there. And you put it in a box and you shake it in a box. And then you open up the cover of the box and magically exactly what you wanted to have happen happens. No way. Not going to work. So how does nature do that? Because nature, we can't see chemistry that way. Well, what we need to think of is imagine that we've got this permanent bond. We've got this reversible snap. We need something orthogonal. That means it doesn't compete with that mechanism. Well, Velcro. That would be something that doesn't compete, right? You've got the spoky part and the fuzzy part. They come together. They don't care about the snaps, right? The Velcro will come together and come apart without the snaps. And we could stick a button in there. And the button doesn't care about the Velcro, doesn't care about the... So now we have four different mechanisms that are orthogonal so they can happen at the same time. If we're going to do a circular economy, we need to do what's called chemical recycling. We need to look at polymers and plastics and look at it through this lens if we're ever going to get serious. Okay, because if you think about it, in nature, we don't recycle big stuff. When we eat food, we broke, break down the proteins to the amino acids. We break down the carbohydrates to the sugars. We break down the components and we reassemble them, but we do it at the same time time. Think about it. An anabolism and catabolism happen simultaneously. And the trick here is not only are the molecules conserved, but the energy is linked and that allows us to do it at a constant sustained energy because we're coupling destruction and construction. 
So nature does not do it separately. It does it at the same time. If we are going to move into a world in the future where chemistry is to be sustainable, we need to do the same thing. We need to design our materials, our plastics, our molecules to be designed to simultaneously construct and reconstruct in simple ways, all right? And so with all these design features, you can make all kinds of crazy and elaborate things. But you know what's really cool? Look at my daughter's cheek here. What do you want to do with my daughter's cheek? You want to pinch it, right? I come from a Sicilian family. It's pathological. Any holiday, we would all have to get hospitalized afterwards because our aunts and uncles pinch in our cheeks. Well, why is it that our cheek returns back to its natural form? Because it has a polymer in it, a, a protein called elastin. Now, let's look at that a little bit closer. Elastin has amino acids. The nitrogen-carbon-carbon -carbon bond, well, that's kind of like these permanent bonds. Now they condense together to make peptides. Those peptides are kind of like snapping together those pieces. The three-dimensional structure is held together in a way kind of like the Velcro, and the desmosine crosslinks are kind of like the snaps. Nature has already taught us how to do this. We just got to open our eyes and our hearts and see for ourselves how to figure this out. But it can be done if we, if we have the desire and the momentum. Example that I have is we have a BPA-free can lining technology that is based on this kind of orthogonal mechanisms where you need to stick to the metal, you need to not absorb things from the from the, the plastic and stuff like that. And Samwa has licensed this technology, is working on it. As you all know in this call here, that every can of, of material is actually a plastic bag that's usually containing a BPA polymer. So we've been able to come up with a BPA-free technology using this 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 line of thinking we also have a desalination technology that we we were funded by the u.s department of energy for it's a polymer that when the sun comes up the polymer uh dissolves into the into the solution and so you become you form an osmotic potential to pull pure water through the membrane when the sun goes down, the polymer precipitates out, you siphon out the polymer, and you can constantly be desalinating water at a municipal level with no input but solar energy. The last one, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna go fast here. The last one is resilience and molecular diversity. We've all heard the story, we take petroleum, we dig it out of the ground, we put one single uh, functional group somewhere in Houston, in Freeport, or in Elizabeth, New Jersey, somewhere, and we put in a hydroxy group or an olefin or something, and then we open up the textbook of organic chemistry to put in the sulfates, the, the amides, the carboxylic acids, the ketones. And so essentially, where did those petroleum materials come from? They come from highly functionalized plant-based materials. You know, imagine, and I know that I'm using dinosaurs here, they're really plants. A hundred million years ago, plants got under the ground through fossilization. They actually created those, the, that fossilized material. We've been trying for over two centuries to do this, to take materials from nature and directly use them into products, biomaterials. Everyone wants biomaterials. But here it is 200 years and we're not really chipping away. Why? The reason we're not is because although you can find a journal article, every material you might want that your heart desires, someone has published a paper saying that they can make it in a bio-based way. The problem is it's really expensive to purify. And that's where the bugaboo is, is that to get things pure for commerce, that's where the cost is. So anyone can make something bio-based, but can you purify it? Now, if I could make a, a time machine and go back in time, I would question that first premise. Do we really need things pure? You know, back in the 50s when we invented all these factories and everything, we six sigma, we want 99.999% pure materials. Now, that locks us into these narrow, narrow processing conditions, so any replacement technology must also be 99.9% .9 pure impossible with a bio-based economy. But why are we doing that? Nature never purifies its material. In fact, nature 
embraces diversity, wants a diversity. In nature, if you look at this, this reindeer, the, the, the stuff in the cell membranes around its heart are operating at a high temperature. The stuff around its hoof is operating in the low temperature, but they're the same materials. They kick in the, the diversity of the materials are designed through nature so that at high temperature, one population kicks in and at another uh, temperature, another population. Nature designs things taking advantage of that diversity, not by purifying it. And so if we can learn how to do that, if we take a bio-based process and it's dirty, but we can make it over and over again, and we then invent the product to embrace that diversity of molecules, now we've got a winner. And now it's cost effective and it, it's going to out, outperform the petroleum materials that don't have that. The, the idea is to think that nature builds things as mixtures for a reason. And when we humans spend a great deal of time and effort separating them, we're kind of screwing up. We should be embracing what nature teaches us. And so one example is, you know, we, we, you know, we had this program. You've probably heard of, of Adidas's ocean plastic shoe, that working in collaboration with Parlay, um, uh, uh, an organization in New York that's done brilliant work working with, with clients to, to respect ocean chemistry and, and ocean sustainability. One example of this and that in collaboration with them, we looked at the natural diversity of materials like a bunch of plastic from the ocean and said, how can we, instead of spending all this time, you know, separating and purifying it, how can we respect the natural distrib distribution of materials? Uh, another example is we've taken and we've discovered a way to take limonene from orange oil, partially hydrolyze it, probe sonicate it to the appropriate frequency, and make it the right density so that we can completely 100% recycle lithium cobalt from lithium batteries using not pure materials, but actually embracing the mixture of materials to accomplish this. Sorry that I went a couple minutes late and I, and I rushed at the end here, but the idea is, is that this provides this framework. I'm not claiming that this is the only way to do things or maybe even the right way to do it, but through my life, these are five ways that I've seen that we need to respect and, and, and celebrate the molecular mechanisms in nature and start applying them to the way that we design products. And in my opinion, it's the only way we can have a circular economy. So thank you for listening to me. Um, as Amy mentioned, there's a green chemistry uh, class at Harvard this spring that I'll be offering on Wednesday, 720. I hope that this is useful and thank you all for, for paying attention. Great. Um, thanks so much, John. We have a lot of uh, comments and that have that have come in, and we have some questions too. So I know we'll, if if it's okay, we can take some questions past the hour. And and if anyone wants to join in, uh, and you know, join the, uh, come on sure back for the questions sure. later. Okay, great. Um, I guess I'll I'll just jump into the questions. Um, from a business perspective, is there a good housekeeping type seal of approval for green chemistry brands and products? Uh, not really, not really. And what I would do, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be going for that. If, if I had a magic wand, if I, if someone said, John, what single thing could you do for commerce and for sustainability? What I would do is I would create a boot camp of green chemistry for product designers and, and, and engineers and chemists. And if I was a company, I would promise the world that every two years, I will make sure that all of my chemists, all my product designers, all my developers will learn what is latest known about mechanisms of environmental damage, what is latest known about mechanisms of cancer, what is latest known about uh, endocrine disruptors. And if we focus on training the people, then all the products they work on will constantly get better. But if we just focus on the products, but don't change the way the people are being trained, we're kidding ourselves thinking we can do it. 
And so let's focus on the people and instead have some accreditation. If you think about it, doctors, lawyers, teachers, nurses all have to maintain a license. They have to get continuing education credits. The world of toxicology, the world of sustainability is evolving constantly, but chemists aren't staying part of that. So if I had a magic wand, I would have all chemists across the globe every two years frequency have some boot camp to learn what is latest known to make sure that what they're doing is at least at the highest level of knowledge. That's great. Question about your asphalt additive. Um, did the asphalt additive meet the con conditions and definitions of green chemistry? I might know the answer to that. So, so yes, there's a, there's a couple <laughs> things to, to, to say here that I, I would argue that there's, you know, the additive itself is edible, okay? And so when, when we at WBI stop working on something, we try to start with materials that people are already eating. Now, the reality is some pe people are eating some pretty nasty things, so there'll probably be some surprises down the road. But we also got to remember that the enemy of the excellent is the perfect. All right, in that I have never worked on a project ever in my life that simultaneously addressed all 12 principles. That chemistry has been around for hundreds of years. And what we need to do is constantly push forward. And I would say that if I don't address the energy use of a product, but I make it less carcinogenic, I owe the world to get that product and reduce cancer. To not give it to the world because I still haven't addressed energy is probably not the way to go about it. Now, once I've done that, someone else may figure out how to address another part. And as we work together in the future and we communicate these advances, we can move forward. But what we don't want to do is, is rob society of anything that moves the needle further. Great, thank you. We have a question from Brazil. Um, in Brazil, people spend a lot of money on performance and not on sustainability. How to link those two factors? How do you link those two factors in green chemistry? Well, there's two ways. There's two ways to do that. Very good friend of mine, Helio Mata, works with an organization trying to interact with the general public to to want it. If you think about it here. We, we make these three buckets, cost, performance, and sustainability. The moment your customer asks for it, it should no longer be in the sustainability bucket. It should be in the performance bucket. So if all the NGOs, if all the groups that are trying to work with society to say demand safer product, demand sustainable product, the argument goes away because it's no longer a sustainable issue. It's a performance issue. Right? And so one part is to do that. Now that takes time and essentially we, we can't afford to wait because there are some things that just need to be dealt with. That's where regulations, that where policies and other things come in place. But the point is, is that if we can invent something that moves the needle forward, that doesn't require the customer to care, we've just made a better product at a better cost that is safer for human health and the environment, that's the best place to be. And so the, that makes it the easiest. And so if the next generation of chemists, if the, if the 21st century chemists and chemical engineers and product designers have the right skills to just invent it and have it built in, then that's the, the most beautiful path forward. It's not easy because no very few universities are training scientists and product developers this, but that would be the best way to approach it. Great. I think we have a lot of agreement there. Um, do you have any advice on how to get large quantity generators of hazardous waste to switch over to greener chemistries? Again, the, we, the invention of the alternative. You know, it's, it's, everything is a house of cards or a Jenga um, woodblock game. You know, everything is so interconnected. We've got to realize that we've got a, a system of massively complicated interrelationships and that just saying, stop making this and make this. 
oftentimes it's just never that simple. You know, that, you know, if, if you have a product, any product, pick a product, there's usually 10, 15 other components. There's a pigment giving it color. There's a additive that's making it not oxidized. There's something else in there. And when we replace one material with something else, everything else starts to go wrong and you have to go back and fix this and fix that. And so sometimes it's a lot more difficult. And so sometimes we've got to incrementally improve the products that are already out there. And sometimes we've just got to come up with a revolutionary product to just replace it with another product. But we need all eyes, we need all ideas on this program to find ways to do that. So there's not a one size fits all. Some, some products is easy trades and you're scratching your head saying, why in the world aren't they using something that already exists? This is where the developing countries come in, and it's, and it's interesting when it comes to sustainability that there are developed countries who will complain that they have an embedded infrastructure that spent already billions of dollars for this factory, and so to retool that factory is economically not feasible. So in places on the earth where there isn't an embedded infrastructure and we build from the ground up, if that happens without using green chemistry, well, that's just a really bad situation because there's so much in green chemistry to offer. And so if we can build the new factories to be consistent with green chemistry, and sometimes that's going to be the way to go forward. But there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Great. Um, that concludes our questions. John, I'm just going to mention we, we've got a number of uh positive feedback comments here, and I'll just read one of them. I just want to mention that this has been the most interesting webinar I've sat through in as long as I can remember. So <laughs> I think that sums it up. Um, thank you so much, John. And I'm going to pause for one, one moment to let Derek um, announce the winner of our raffle, of our book raffle. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, so the winner for today's book raffle is, is Aline Oliveres. So um, look out for an email from us here shortly at, at the end of our webinar, and uh, we'll be in contact and send you uh, the book as soon as we can. All right, great. Okay, thank you so much, John, for a wonderful presentation and for giving us some really great ideas and bringing green chemistry innovation into the circular economy. Um, thank you all for listening in on this webinar. Um, as a reminder, recordings and supporting documents are posted on our website by the end of the day, and um, please sign up for our mailing list to be notified about upcoming webinars as well, right on, the, right on our homepage, beyondbenign.org. So with that, thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all.